In chapter 7, we want to work with something called the normal distribution. Now, we've seen the normal distribution before. We saw it actually in chapter 3, so let me bring up those notes. Right here in section 3.2, we learned about the empirical rule, um, which says that um, based off of data, what happens when a distribution is roughly normal or bell-shaped, there's that normal bell-shaped, approximately 68% of the data will lie within one standard deviation of the mean, 95% within two standard deviations of the mean, and 99.7% within three standard deviations of the mean. Now the key is the word approximately, because at the time, you know, that was fine for us, approximately, you know, seems all well and good, right? But we want to get a little bit more precise about it now. And we're going to be able to using the techniques we learn in Chapter 7. So we'll be able to kind of forget about this whole picture thing. I mean, although if we wanted to, we could recreate it at any point. But we want to be able to be more precise than just saying approximately 34% in this section. And we'll be able to do that um, based off of the formula for the normal curve once we learn what it is. Okay, so now before we head into the normal curve, let's consider how where we're coming from. So we were just working with binomial distributions. Now, binomial distributions are um, discrete distributions. So let's look at this particular example. We have x being the number of tails that land up when you toss six fair coins. So you can imagine you have six pennies in your hand. You throw them up in the air. What do they land on? Well, that's a discrete distribution because you can't have 4.243 tails. You either have four tails showing or you have five tails showing, and that's it. And speaking of four or five tails showing, I've shaded that region just like it says to. Right there, it asks us to shade the region of four or five tails, which are these two bars right here. Right, And those bars for the whole thing, right, the entire thing, must add up to one. They have to. Not just the two, but all of the bars, right? So all of the bars must sum to one. Now, what about a dis, um, to me, a continuous distribution, namely the normal distribution? So how does that look? So I have the diameter of a rose blossom in centimeters. CM stands for centimeters. Now notice that's continuous because a rose actually can measure 4.243 centimeters. I don't know why I picked on 4.243 centimeters, but that's fine in diameter. Okay, so we want to shade the region that corresponds to the probability of a blossom having a diameter between 20 and 25. So I've shaded that right here. So there's 20, there's 25, and we've shaded that region. Now keep in mind the area under the entire curve has to be 1 because it's a probability density curve, and therefore all of the areas have to add up to 1, just like all of the bars up here had to add up to 1 because this was a discrete distribution. Now in chapter 6, for discrete displays, to find the probabilities, we would shade individual bars. Right? But in chapter 7, to display find probabilities, there aren't any bars. So we need to shade regions under the curve. Right? Now one other thing to keep in mind is that continuous distributions cannot find exact probabilities. Right? Now, this might seem a little strange to you, um, what I mean by exact probabilities. Well, what I mean is the probability of, for example, 20. The probability of 20 centimeters alone is zero. You can't do it. And the reason you can't do it is because that line at 20 has no area. If probability is area and there is no area at any one specific value, there's only area in regions. That's very different from discrete distributions. Like a discrete distribution of four, I could totally find. I just need the area of this bar and I'm done. Well, let's face it, I just need the height of this bar. Since the width is one, all the height would be would be my probability. So it looks like 0.23 or so. But down here at 20, the height is not my probability. It's the area that's my probability. And since the line at 20 technically has no area, there is no probability for an exact value like that. There you go. I changed the wording just a little bit. But you cannot find the probability of exact values because an exact value line would have no area under the curve. So that's quite different from a discrete distribution where we were finding exact values all over the place. That's what binome PDF did for us. But that's not going to be the case for the normal curve. So let's start analyzing the normal curve just a little bit and let's look at some of its properties. Alright, so first of all, in case you're wondering, the normal curve is a function. It's a 
normal probability density function. And since it's a function, if you remember from some algebra class somewhere along the way, that means it's y equals and then some function of x. And this is that function. Um, pi is the pi you know and love from geometry class. E is the E you've learned about in algebra class. Sigma is your standard deviation and mu is your mean. Well, that's super, super complicated, but of course, we're not actually going to type this into our calculator anytime soon. The TID4 calculators have standard loaded um, the normal density function as part of um, the distribution menu. So you won't need to worry about learning that function formula. I just wanted to show it to you so you could look at it and go, ooh, I don't want to work with that. Exactly. Well, you are going to work with that, but it's going to be kind of hidden in the background in your calculator. Now, the normal curve, when you look at it, and I just put one up down here, it's symmetric around that line down the center. And the line down the center always happens at mu, your mean. So it's going to be symmetric around mu. There we have it. Um, the center of the curve depends entirely on, well, mu, where the curve would be the highest, right? So a normal curve is going to have its center on where that center or where the mu is. So it's going to be symmetric around mu, and it's going to be dependent upon mu for where the center is. So right here in the middle. So whatever value that is, that's where your center is. So if you look back at this curve, 15 was my center because 15 was my mu there. All right, now the curve has inflection points at the mean minus the standard deviation and the mean plus the standard deviation. All right, so that's mu minus sigma and mu plus sigma. And let me explain what I wrote there, and then I'll go back to writing it so you can see it. But here's mu plus sigma right here, and here's mu minus sigma. And they always fall at the same spot and the same height on both sides. And it's where the curve stops being concave down, because it's concave down right in the center, and starts being concave up. So let me show you um, a line up for it real quickly. So there's the mean, which is the line of symmetry in the center. And then to show you the standard deviations, I'm just going to kind of make a couple more real quick. There they are. So where this kind of maroon line hits, where that touches, that's the inflection point. Um, if you're ever in calculus class, for example, it's where the second derivative is equal to zero, in case you're interested. It's, um, you know what it is if you've ever been on a roller coaster in your life. So when you're on a roller coaster, you're sitting up here at the top of the hill, and then you start going down it. This is kind of the point where you feel yourself lifting off the chair right? And it's because you're going as fast as you can. Um, there's a lot of other physics going on there that I don't want to get into. And then you get slammed back down in your seat as you hit the bottom of the curve, right? So that's what the inflection points are. And they are the same height on the left and the right. And it's about halfway, um, a little bit above halfway. So if you take your lowest point on the curve at the bottom and the highest point at the top, it's kind of just a bit above the halfway point between the two. That's going to be your inflection points. It should be the same height on either side. All right, so that's where your standard deviations fall, and that's what I wrote here. The inflection points are where the graph shifts from being concave down to concave up, and it's the curve is the steepest. They'll always be um, where the one, the first standard deviation falls on either side of the mean. So the first standard deviation falls on either side of the mean. All right, now what about the shape? Well, the shape of the curve depends on what your standard deviation is. So the smaller your sigma, the narrower slash steeper your graph is, right? And the larger your sigma, the wider slash shallower, I guess, more spread out your graph is. And then the total area under the curve is one, obviously. And the area under the curve to the right of the mean. Okay, so here's the mean, which is the blue line. So what's the area under the curve to the right of that? All of this over here to the right. Past the red line, before the red line, everything. Well, it's going to make 0.5, right? Because if the whole curve makes 1 and the mean is in the middle, then it's got to be 0.5 on either side. So the area under the curve and to the right and to the left, it's the same. It's always half, 50-50. Remember, the line itself in the middle doesn't have any area, so that's why it doesn't count. So the line in the center is the mean, the symmetric line. One other thing is that technically, the normal curve never touches the x-axis. 
and it gets closer and closer and closer to it but never touches it that's how the theoretical hypothetical curve works of course in practicality um, from a practicality standpoint we know that when we apply this to real life data it won't go on forever but we'll assume sort of that it could um, for the sake of our calculations which isn't that hard of an assumption to make you'll be fine the calculator does almost all of it all right, I'm gonna stop right here, but I will warn you that the next example is talking about, uh, let's see, this part right here, the shape of the curve depending on sigma, and this part right here, the center of the curve depending on mu. So those two bits are exactly what's getting explored in your next example. So enjoy that, and I hope that it helps you understand the normal curve.